Welcome to Raging Bullets, a comics fan podcast, season two, episode 27. We look at Star Wars from 2015, issues one what through is that three. Supposed to mean? That's a word that I have never seen. Do you exist strategically? Suddenly, I don't feel as smart as I used to be. I couldn't find it in a dictionary. Oh, what the heck is strategery? Why I need to know? I don't know. It's just my way. I asked a friend I know, and they told me go. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I am Sean Whalen, Dr. Norge, and I'm joined by, as always, the smuggler of all smugglers, Jim, the sensei of the whatnot, Segulin. How's it going, eh? Jim, on this episode, we're going to begin a two-part look at the first arc from Star Wars 2015, featuring uh, Jason Aaron and John Cassidy. We are sponsored, as always, by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Mr. Segulin, what is going on over at DCBService.com? It's Sting! (laughs) AEW Gallery Sting PVC Statue. 25% off, only $44.99. Thank you, DC. Is that the one him standing with the bat and he's got like the light in the background? I've got that sitting on my right behind me right now. It's beautiful. Because I own that. That's that's (laughs) well worth getting if anybody's an AEW fan or Sting, a longtime Sting fan. It's gorgeous. Over at InStockTrades.com, they have their deals of the week. These DC Finest series are starting to be released, and they've got Batman Year 1 and 2 as a trade paperback. It's $39.99 regularly, 55% off, only $17.99. And Superman, the first hero trade paperback, $39.99 regularly, 50% off, only $17.99. ROM, the original Marvel Years, Omnibus Hardcover, Volume 3. There's two different covers of this, 125 regularly, 46% off, only $67.50 each. The Batman First Night Hardcover, $29.99 regularly, 50% off, only $14.99. Vinland Saga Deluxe Hardcover, Volume 5, $54.99 regularly, 45% off, only $34, or only $30.24. And then the Wild Cats Compendium Number 1 Trade Paper Back, $59.99 regularly, 50% off, only $29.99. I love those deals of the week because it's a, just a diverse group of comics. Something for everybody at a great discount. Thank you, DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for supporting our show. Mr. Segulin, what kind of a podcast are we? The Raging Bullets podcast is a spoiler podcast. We go in depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we are discussing on today's show. So if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later to better enjoy the show. I don't know what that ding was, but it sounded like Darth Vader was like microwaving popcorn or something like that, and it just finished. (laughs) But I loved everything about that. That was fantastic. Let's talk some comics. So, Jim, for this episode, we're, we're talking about the 2015 Marvel series Star Wars by Jason Aaron and John Cassidy. And we'll, we'll do the full creative team in a few minutes. But um, the reason why I chose this is John Cassidy passed away quite recently. And uh, we don't always get an opportunity to be responsive when really cool creators have passed on to do something to honor them, if that makes sense. This one just struck at a time where... I was moved to uh, do something relating to John Cassidy, and I thought, like, hey, Star Wars would be something really cool. This is a series that um, Star Wars is something you and I both grew up with. Um, We we likely either have very similar or unique experiences, and I figured it would be a great opportunity to talk about something a little different on the podcast, while at the same time honoring some really beautiful artwork and storytelling by Jason Aaron, who you and I are both big fans of. So that's how this all came about. Jumping back in history for our um, 
you know, like Star Wars. What what was Star Wars to you? And and I mean, are you have you been a big Star Wars fan? Are you a big Star Wars fan? Where what has been kind of your life experience when it comes to Star Wars? Well, it, it's funny. You know, a lot of people will say you're either a Star Trek fan or you're a Star Wars fan. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. You know, which side are you on, Trek or Wars? I'm both. Uh, I'll be honest. I love Star Trek, but I love Star Wars. Star Wars has always had that just that soft spot in my heart. And part of it is actually from the fact that, you know, when it hit the theaters, the very first time New Hope was out there, this was like one of the first movies I got to go see without my parents. Oh, wow. This was, you know, and again, I I was with my brothers, you know, and I was with all my brothers. So my brother is Bill, Dave, but also my third brother, Angelo, who's a longtime family friend, but he's a brother to me. You know, so it was kind of a neat experience that I got to go out with all my older brothers, you know, to see this movie. You know, so for me, that was just like this unbelievable thing. And I, I'll be honest, I don't remember if mom and dad dropped us off at the theaters or if we took our bikes. I, I want to I think they dropped us off. And when my brother Bill, Bill's listening to the show, he'll remember. Maybe maybe he won't. Um, but, you know, it was the the old Shoregate uh, Theater. Oh yeah, um, you remember that one? Yeah. yeah, that's that's where I saw Star Wars. The theater has since been torn down, but you know, but you know, it's you know that was like the very first Star Wars movie. That was the first movie. Then, then um, I actually saw it a second time, and this time when we saw it a second time, we talked mom and dad into going with us. So it was a family outing, and my sister, you know, Mary went as well. So it was a full family outing going to see Star Wars. So you know, again, back in you know. When I, I was a little kid, I didn't usually go to the theater multiple times for the same movie. You've already seen it. Why do you need to go in? Star Wars was always a multiple watch. And, I, and it was, you know, it was just, again, it's the experience. And I ended up seeing New Hope, I think, like, in the theater, I saw it at least four, maybe five times. You know, and it's just I'm remembering different times when I've saw, when I've seen it. And I think it was all the first runnings, not re re uh, playing. Of it. But it was funny because... One of the things with Star Wars is the the big epic fight scene at the end, you know, when they're you're going after the Death Star and all that all that action going on, all the explosion. My mom fell asleep during that scene. <laughs> she literally really slept through the Death Star blowing up. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. So and again, so all this kind of memories always rings with me with Star Wars. You know, and when Empire came out, I was excited. Return of the Jedi, I was like, yeah, this is awesome. You know, and as kids, we, we, had, we had all the toys. We had all the, the different stuff. And it was just amazing. You know, for me, Star Wars itself was, has always had that place where I'm like, I love this. And it's neat to see, you know, uh, nieces and nephews have the same kind of reaction to this. But the current version of stuff. You know, uh, you know, Clone Wars was huge with uh, my brother Dave's kids, you know, and it was just there's a lot of just it's just it's there's something that keeps going on generation after generation after generation. And even the movies that people pan, I still loved. I still cheered for and I still enjoyed just because it was another Star Wars movie. And again, it's and the move the theme obviously always hits it's home and just there's the, you know, in the moments of Vader, you know, anytime Vader was on the scene with the breathing and just the presence and the dun, dun, da 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 just that, that energy. I always just love that. You know, it was just, you know, this was what, this was the, the birth of my love of a movie soundtrack, you know? And it's funny because as a kid, I didn't realize that until later as an adult, when, you know, I'm, you know, watching movies and it's like it's missing something well it was missing a really kick-ass score it was missing that that energy that the the audio soundtrack and then when you get some movies where they have it playing in the background you're just like oh that is cool you know and you notice it just because this was crap this was crafted by a master you know and it's one of those things when i'm reading this i'm hearing the sounds i'm hearing the voices i'm hearing the background music you know there's just so much that Star Wars has been a part of me and who I am that, 
you know, I just, uh, so when you said let's read, so I was like, heck yeah, <laughs> you know, I was all in because, <laughs> you know, and it's, I've read some of the Star Wars comics and you know, I read the, you know, the Thrawn, uh, series, you know, a portship of, uh, Leia, uh, Splinters in the Mind's Eye, you know, a lot of different, you know, novels, of Star Wars. Uh, That's what I was going to ask you. Did you read, the, so yeah. you said the Thrawn books, did you read like Heir to the Empire and stuff yeah. like that oh, yeah, in novel yeah. form? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it, um, you know, it, it uh, the yeah the Thrawn series is you know Splinters in the Mind's Eye and Courtship of Princess Leia are the ones that really are like pop first in my head. But there's so many wait, other wait hold on that I've read. Hey, let, me, let me add some of that. Did you read those Han Solo ones when you were a kid? You know what I'm, ones I'm talking about? The, oh like, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? There was yes. like there was there oh, was God, a, there yes. was a there was a, a couple really good Han Solo books that came out yes. when we were kids. Around the same time of like Splinter in the Mind, like after Splinter in the Mind's yes. Eye, uh, those were um, I remember enjoying those greatly. Yeah, I and I'll be honest, I remember I borrowed those. Or, yeah, again, I mentioned Angelo before; he had them. So after he read them, you know, my brother Bill read them, then Dave, and then me. So we all read that, you know. You know, and again, it's you know, it, this was you know, yeah, we're diving heavy into this stuff. So yeah, I, I remember. I don't remember. Funny, I don't remember the titles. But I remember I, reading the series. I want to say one was Han Solo at Star's End, but don't don't uh, yeah, quote I, me I on that for sure. It was something like it was something like that. And there was it's, another it's there was another one. Right now. But it was it was Han Solo and Chewie. I mean, it was yeah. it, it was uh, them having adventures. So it was really really cool because Han Solo was just the cool character at the time. My experience um, was largely the same as yours. Um, in the sense that uh, I, I grew up loving Star Wars. Um, as far as Star Trek versus Star Wars, let me just go there because you went there as well. I have trouble with that comparison. It was funny when I did my job interview, um, I was asked that by my superintendent and I said, Doctor Who. <laughs> I said to throw out there. Nice. But um, I, I don't think that's even accurate because I love Star Trek. I love Star Wars and I love Doctor Who. I love all of those properties. And I think they they all scratch very different itches. If that makes sense in, in all the right ways, Star Wars was a phenomenon when it came out. And for younger listeners out there, and, and for those of you, you know, who were who were around during the same era where Jim and I saw this in the theater, you know, this was a time where movies would come back, like and you would get shut out of movies. So there'd be times where like you'd go there for a showing. So like you, I saw it in the theater multiple times. I saw it with my dad the first time. Just fell in love. It it was I didn't know I wanted it. <laughs> yeah. You know, you see something and you're just like, wow, this is captivating. You, It was a movie that leapt off the screen. You wanted to play Star Wars. You wanted to be Star Wars. You wanted to, I mean, it, it, it like, and you played this with friends. And, you know, you wanted to be key characters in Star Wars and just go out and play. Um, and that, that you know, t- that tells the the ages that we were and things like that. But it was it was a cultural experience at the time. And when this film came back in the theaters, because you didn't have, like, cable, you know, and things like that, and you didn't have the opportunity to buy it. We're very used to right now, like, you go see something in the theater, and you're going to buy it, you know, within that same year. That didn't happen. So when that was gone from the theater and it came back, that was your shot to see it again. And to see it in the theater, and it was a destination view. It like you went back, and it was in the theater for another run. It wasn't like one view. Like nowadays, it's it's like Fathom events and stuff like that. Not uncommon to have a film come back. No, this came back, and like you would see it for another run, and maybe see it another couple of times if you were lucky. Uh, and I I know I saw it at Shoregate, like you had mentioned, but not the first time. The first time I saw it at Menor Mall. In Menor, they um they had uh, remember they had that Menor. They were they had the theater in Mentor Mall. Yes, yes. And uh, so I remember seeing it there. Really just loved. It was Star Wars. I mean, it was just really, really great. And it was breathtaking. The music, the spectacle, and everything about it. My love for it, I never left. Uh, It was one of those things where, you know, I've, I've jumped on and off Star Wars in the sense that I've read books. I've read the comics. Dark Horse 
produced amazing comics. It's funny when people talk about Star Wars and like there's no good Star Wars. I'm like, you're not trying. (laughs) (laughs) Admittedly, there's some Star Wars that's better than others. So if you're somebody who is a casual Star Wars fan, I would direct you to like really look around and and research online the stuff that people are saying are great. I actually would start with like what, what we're talking about today, I think will scratch that great Star Wars itch. I will admit I'm a Star Wars fan who ha- I enjoy any Star Wars. So there's stuff that I'll watch that I know is this is okay Star Wars. For me, I'm enjoying it because it's more Star Wars like you referenced earlier. But I would not necessarily recommend it to a casual fan because I know this isn't going to be for you. Okay, Star Wars isn't for that person. It's for your diehard Star Wars fans that's like looking for more of it. There's okay Star Wars, there's good Star Wars, and then there's great Star Wars. And you were actually referencing some stories there. The Thrawn Saga, I think, is great Star Wars. Oh, my God. I, I like, love that one. Yeah, if you didn't like the tri- like the trilogy, the most recent trilogy, I don't know, go read the Thrawn stuff. Like, to me, that's great Star Wars. I wish they had... I I liked the Ray Finn saga, and so I'm, I'm a fan that falls in that category. But I'm also I'm a rational person that recognizes why that didn't meet the needs of everybody. Yeah. Uh, whereas I would say the people that did not enjoy that, go read, start with Heir to the Empire and read all three of those books and you will get the story you were looking for. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's there. It's it's in, unfortunately, it's in, that's, and it's in an audio book, so you can do it that way. And it's also been a comic adaptation. I would highly, highly recommend that you start first, though, with the novel. Go ahead and read and enjoy that, or or the audio book, so that way you experience it that way. Then enjoy the comic. Um, the comic adaptation is fantastic, by the way. I'm not knocking that. If you're like me, though, if if there's a novel version and I've read the comic, it's harder for me sometimes to jump back to the novel. I usually like to read the novel first, then go enjoy the comic adaptation. So if you fall in that category, please read the novel first, because it's well worth the experience. The novels, there's three of them. It's a trilogy. Yeah. So that stuff's all good. The Dark Horse stuff. Have you read any of the Dark Horse comics? Actually, I've read some of it, yeah. That stuff's top-notch and stellar. So that's going to be one of the interesting pieces. This, what we're covering today, all of that Dark Horse stuff, the Thrawn stuff that we're talking about, they're in their own universe. So that's a what if George Lucas did the prequel saga, did the original trilogy, and never did another three movies. The Disney movies, the Disney stuff never happened. So the books went into their own direction, and there was an expanded universe that went into Dark Horse Comics. Many, many novels. There's a whole multiverse of Star Wars you can read over there that told the history of the Jedis, told all kinds of stories. Some of that stuff did transfer over when Disney took over, and they've kind of made that stuff canon. A lot of it didn't. So there's some great Star Wars stories that are over there that, like, I would not dismiss because it's not Disney canon. I would go and enjoy and take, like, I don't know, I'm a big Batman Elseworlds fan. Read that Elseworlds Star Wars stuff and soak it up. Because <laughs> oh, yeah. it's really, really good. Um, and, and it's one of those things that, with a lot of that I was reading, I was hearing the voices. You mm-hmm. know, the, creat- the, the writers got the characters down so much that I could hear Harrison Ford's voice or yeah. Mark Hamill, you know, I could hear Vader. I could, you know, well, not Vader on some of them because he was already gone. But um, the uh, a lot of those, you know, things you could hear the character. You can actually hear the actors' voices, you know, so they had their dialogue and just their pattern and just everything down as I'm reading it. And, and that's something with this one as well, by the way, as I was reading it, I was hearing all their voices. And it's kind of neat to hear the voice of the people who've already passed, you know, hearing their voice again. You're just like, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're not gone. <laughs> and that's a piece where, as we get into this, we start talking about the artwork and, and everything of it. I think that's going to be a piece where it wasn't just the voices. You, the visuals were stunning. Yes. Let, me, let me go ahead and do the creative team real quick, and let, let's just start talking about this. The writer is Jason Aaron. The artist is John Cassidy. The colorist is Laura Martin. The letterer is Chris Iliopoulos. Cover artists are Cassidy and Martin. The assistant editor is Charles Beecham. The editor is Jordan D. Wright. Uh, White, I'm sorry. The executive editors are C.B. Sabolsky and Mike Martz. Editor in chief is Axel Alonso. The creative chief creative officer was Joe Casada, and the publisher was Dan Buckley. 
For Lucasfilm, the senior editor was Jennifer Heddle. Lucasfilm Story Group was Robert Rain Roberts, Pablo Hidalgo, and Leland Lee. I just out of the gate, the cover is just spectacular. Uh, I happen to be looking right now at the director's cut, which is a very, very similar cover. There's, I mean, there's just some, um, I, I want to say, some sketch material towards the bottom. You know, they they like it amalgamates from a, a traditional cover into a sketch cover just to indicate that it's a director's cut. Oh, but nice. I love this look of the fact that this takes place at right after A New Hope. So Empire Strikes Back has not happened yet. Um, we get to see Luke in that ceremonial jacket that he was working when he and Han and uh, Chewie all got their medals and stuff. I always thought that flight jacket and that whole look was really cool at the end of A New Hope. We didn't get to see it film again afterwards. I like that it's here, and I like that it's on the cover, and I like that it's the whole gang on the cover with that just brilliant shot of the X-Wings and the TIE Fighters. It just feels, the layout, very, very Star Wars and just got me excited to turn the page. And, and again, also cool that it's Vader's head, you know, in the background mm-hmm. and all that stuff. So that, that was, again, everything you're saying, echoing on it. But also, I like the fact that it was because I remember first time looking at it, I was, I, I was, you're focused on everybody. And then I took a step back and I'm like, oh, that's Vader's head. That is cool. I love this. <laughs> Yeah, and it's just gorgeous. And the faces and the capture. One of the things I really appreciate is the fact that it's not photorealistic. And it sounds like I'm insulting the artwork. I promise I'm not. I actually really like the fact that he really captures what I think is the visual look of the faces of each of the characters. You clearly know who everyone is. There's clearly John Cassidy's art styling in there, but... It's clearly like he's used reference material. He knows who Han is. He knows who Luke is and Leia is. It's clearly them, and he's clearly you know portraying the actors there. But it's got his art styling there too, and I, it's the right balance of both. If I'm making any sense, because this is a beautiful, beautiful piece of work, and I'm not just saying that because of it. I picked this one because I thought this is a very pretty book. I wanted to talk about just how pretty it is. Yeah. Well, and again, going along with what you just said about photorealism, it's kind of like sometimes how an artist will take, you know, Christopher Reeves and make him their drawing of Superman. And yes. I always, I always smile when I see that just because, you know, I'm like, yeah, yeah, he's my Superman too, you know, but I do like, you know, when the artists take their own and give us either their own take on it or their own creation on it. You know, this is something that, again, as you said, there's no doubt in my mind who everybody is. You know, there's enough of the reference to the actor that it is, you know, nod to it. But this is his art style. This is his work. You know, and I really love just the look on it. And there's going to be a couple scenes later on that when we start talking, I'm going to be gushing about the artwork. The layout of this piece, it opens up with the classic. Yeah. You know, it's a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away the typical Star Wars logo, and the crawl. And it needed to be here. I just, I felt like this was, it was so reminiscent of the films, and it needed to be, because it's fitting between episode four and five, and I like that choice, because I feel like this is something that is, it's weird to say untapped because Marvel did its own Star Wars series in the past and there were Star Wars comic strips in the past. And uh, I mean, there's been years of this kind of storytelling. It I feel like, though, this feels fresh, if that makes any sense, especially knowing that like we've rebooted the canon, you know, and we're going off of the fact that four, five and six happened. But this is new storytelling there. So this completely felt very fresh to me. And I just, I wanted, I'm like reading The Crawl. I'm really excited to see what's going on. And it's important to set the stage here because it needs to set the tone for the Death Star has just blown up. This is a rebel alliance that is trying to start initiating the next phase, you know, and continue their attempt to take over from the Empire and to take the battle to them. This was just the first battle, and it was really a battle of survival, and I'm, I like that there's that feeling there. And we're getting character progression. And this is everything that you and I love about continuity comics, where there's that move forward movement of characters. This is storytelling that 
Oh my, when I'd say, I'd say I would have eaten this up as a kid. This made me feel like a kid. Yes. Uh, from the first second that I turn the page and I start seeing this spacecraft, I am glued. Because we're talking about the the great character models that he, the, the great art, artistry with the characters. Space, the spaceships, the planets, everything. I'm just like, I wish this was animated. Oh, it's so good. And I'll tell you, that's something that, you know, this opening sequence, everything you said about the, this pop of the Star Wars, the crawl, I'm like, yes, I was, I had this stupid grin on my face when I first started reading this. Mm-hmm. And then as you're flipping it, you know, you think back to how all the movies start. All the movies start with a big, epic space scene of a ship coming in. Yep. You know, and I love that they continued doing that in this. You know, and the way they did the multiple panels with the pure space and some of the ship, the ship in the middle, and then the ship overlapping onto the moon. I'm like, oh, that is such cool. That is, I love this. This again, you know, motion on a still page. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Motion on a still page is really, really great. The details on the ships, too, are really important to me because uh, it's something that we're, we were dealing with practical models in a lot of what Lucasfilm did. Everything was very cutting edge then. And it's why even today, you know, George Lucas did his special editions and things over there. But even today, these the effects in Star Wars, so much of it stands up still because I'm I'm a big fan of practical effects when they're done right and when they're done with the level of detail they did in Star Wars. It's something different. It's and it's to a certain extent, some of it's a lost art. I love when I'm watching in this artwork, I'm seeing this ship approaching the planet. It feels like something George Lucas would have done. Like he would have made scale models of this and yeah. done something like super cool with it. Oh God. Yeah. And again, just this opening sequence, the big ship coming in, the land, you know, and I love just the, the, you know, the empire, just being the empire, you know, out of rim scum, anything remotely suspicious, kill them all. And I'm just like, oh God, I mean, it opens up and out walks hand. And I love just, I love how they did this. So initially you have the dialogue going on. You know, the official emissary of his high exalted, you know, exaltedness, the illustrious job of the great, mightiest of all huts, master of tattooing, grand warlord of the outer rim, but you can call me hand. I'm like, oh yay, <laughs> you know, I cheered. I actually cheered when I was reading this. <laughs> and it's, I like that behind him, I had absolutely no doubt who those who, were, yeah. That's exactly, like, I I will say what was taken aback for me is I was, a part of me in my mind went to Lando right away. Yeah. And that was an example of where I I wasn't placing myself in the correct time. Like, no, Lando wouldn't have been a part of this yet. Uh, I loved how all of this played out because it sets, it predates and sets a stage for costuming and things that they ended up using later were now taking place right after A New Hope. I love that. I love that this was something that would come back later on. Well, they do that, you know, throughout this book where there's stuff that hasn't been in, if, you know, in the New Hope universe, we haven't seen this yet. Yes. You know, but we know it's coming down the line. And so every time there was something new like that, I popped. Like you, I thought immediately back to when Lando was wearing, you know, the the, the guard. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, that was Jabba's guards of course they're going to be wearing that that's cool i love that <laughs> i like how han you know really is trying to play off his relationship with jabba the hut like <laughs> still being a thing while in the meantime it is a known quantity that there is a price on his head i like that the empire just doesn't really care <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're like you know we're not looking to collect anything here it's like listen if you say you're with jabba and like, come on, let's keep moving and, and just get this thing going. They're very, because it's the ego, right, of the power of the Empire yes. at this time that they don't, they look at Solo and the bounty hunters and Jabba and all that thing as something below them. It's their Empire is something much bigger. It's a much bigger energy and entity it's a much bigger engine and they report to the emperor they vote to they report to darth vader they report to their own generals um and admirals and their own kind of and i really love how that machine works like nothing about this was unbelievable Uh, but i like that the overarching world 
the other bounty hunter would no one was you know would cry foul on what Solo was saying there, and I really liked that. Or the alien, you know, was saying that same piece. I really liked that attention to detail. And you know, Han would have just gone off on a brilliant uh, BS rant to explain the funny story if he needed to. He was ready for that, Dude. you know. And and I can hear him just that little chuckle. Ha! I can explain that funny story, really. And he's just getting ready to go into hand mode. He's ready to start the, you know, the double talk and the flim flam that he is a master of. But didn't need to because they don't care. You know, and I was like, again, all that completely fits. 100% locks in. And I was so happy when, you know, when we see the crosshairs on him, you know, and then you flip the page and it's oh. Chewie, you know, taking a sniper spot overseeing and i'm like okay good there's chewy i was wondering where chewy was going to be at you know i didn't know where he was where he was going to be but you knew he had to be on the planet can we flip back that one page though and like look above those crosshairs that panel above the crosshairs is striking look at that han solo oh, yeah. face um, yeah just the mannerisms like you could see harrison ford in totally in that image I marvel at that when we've got, you know, artists that are drawing and they're able to capture, you know, I mentioned photorealism before. It's not about it being looking like a photo. It's about an artist being able to capture the the essence of a real living human being like that. That's beautiful. I mean, that yeah. is a, just a beautiful job of capturing Harrison Ford there. You don't need every panel to have that. It's not something I'm looking for in a comic like this. What... What it is is, though, when you establish that in panels like this, in those moments, you are taking people further and further in this journey of this is a movie that I am living through right now in reading this story. He did that so many times with so many characters throughout this. And it's the point where he was also doing that with these other emperor, you know, empire characters, I should say, and the alien that was in there. It was capturing a mood of this is a three-dimensional world that is coming to life. I was seeing a film unfolding before me, even though it wasn't really a film. And and that's really what I want from Star Wars comics. This would that's what makes this one of those where I'm like, this is great Star Wars. It's yes. like page turning after page turning. And to your point, I'm not gonna. I, I can't say anything further about the Chewy piece other than what you already did, because um, I just think that was. I, I was geeking out. <laughs> so cool. Oh god, yeah. I you know, Chewy is one of. The, I love Chewy. I've always you know thought he was an awesome character, and it was one of those things where I, I I've always thought he never got the true respect he deserves. You know, and again, Han, Luke, you know, Leia, they are awesome characters. You know, and R2 constantly, you know, you know, has gotten, you know, the, you know, much uh, props to the, you know, to that little droid. But Chewie is the one I always thought got kind of like overlooked, even though he's been throughout all the movies. He's been this great character throughout all the movies. There's always been Chewie, you know. So, again, you got to have respect for uh, the big Wookiee. I like how the, the, the talks and the conversation starts to break down between Han and the Empire. <laughs> And I like how that just gradually, you know, they're trying to basically say in the typical Empire fashion that this isn't a negotiation. Uh, this is going to go the way that we want it to. And you know how those deals, as we've seen throughout movies that take place after this, those deals go sour. And Han would know how to react to that piece. I like that there was a plan in place. I even like how R2, you know, takes a piece in that one because that was a great R2 sequence yes. where he starts leaking the fuel and starts using the electricity as a way to uh, start taking out what the stormtroopers that were there. R2 is such a sleeper hit in yeah. all of the Star Wars movies because it you don't overuse them. But when he does come into play like this, it's always a really cool sequence. There's a bit of a chuckle and a humor value to it, which always works well with Star Wars. Star Wars has this nice blend of high action intrigue. Like, this is a fast-moving, very cool opening Star Wars movie sequence. And that's exactly what it needs to be. It's an opening movie sequence. It's setting the stage for reminding you who all the players are, starting to build towards a new sense of intrigue, uh, which is what an opening Star Wars scenes needs to do. It, it's doing all of those things right. And there's a lot that, like, 
as Disney's trying to navigate, and, and I say Disney, I'm talking about anybody who is associating with Disney and trying to navigate Star Wars, you learn a lot from reading this comic. Because I feel like the pacing of this is what is the magic of great Star Wars. Um, there's character movement, character development. You're getting to know the character through intriguing situations where you're <laughs> like, oh, man, it's it's not... It's not that the conflict is there. It's how it's being handled. Um, There's a unique Han Solo, Princess Leia, Luke Skywalker, R2-D2, and Chewbacca handling of all this that just makes the sequence so great. Because, you know, the rebellious kind, when Han flips that piece off (laughs) and we see the other two clear, the look on his face, the way Luke is drawn, and Leia's reveal back there... All three of those th- like were absolutely perfect. Looking down the gun sight of that blaster, that was just perfection. That yes. is perfection. And I do love the fact that it's Leia really is throwing down. Because she that's something that always was the coolness of her. And then she was not she really never was the damsel in distress, even when they rescued her. You know, she you know, in the middle of the rescue, you know, in New Hope. She took over, you know. It's you know. So Leah again, another really cool moment, seeing her dropping the stormtrooper, and then dropping the uh, the one imp- imperial guy. It's you know, yeah, I like seeing her being able to throw down. She's just as much a warrior as those two are. So I'm ha- I, again, you know, moments of while I'm watching this, I'm cheering. I like how. He's he's not st- he's like ready to stand his ground until R two puts out his uh, yeah. he's ready to shock him again. Then he gives the direction. The movement is really great because there's this sense of frantic escape. Like the, it is again the four of them trying to get out of this place, and they've got to move quick. They're counting on the Millennium Falcon, but it's being guarded by C three PO. And yes. you, the second I saw three PO there, I was like. Oh, this is not going to go well. <laughs> There's something that's going to happen when they leave three PO guarding the ship. Yeah, I, I was sitting there. I'm like, I've got a bad feeling about this. <laughs> mm-hmm. I did like the sense though of this is a big facility, and they have they have the option. You know, they're sneaking through. They're taking advantage of the fact that the alarm hasn't been sounded. They're sneaking through and trying to take advantage of that. We're also seeing some opportunities for. Luke is not the Jedi that we see yet in Empire and Return of the Jedi, but he is the Jedi who managed to take down the Death Star and has worked with Obi-Wan. So he's we're seeing some introductory feeling out and uncertainty around being a Jedi. Like we're seeing some cool moments where he's finding that peace and, and trying to tap into that inner Jedi within him without kind of knowing what that means yet, because this is pre-Yoda. I really liked that feel of this is something very powerful. It's very much there. We're seeing it as the reader and experiencing it with him, but it is a journey that he is on and he's not confident in it. I like that accessibility of Luke because I think later on when he starts to become more of a seasoned Jedi in Return of the Jedi, for example, it means more because of the journey between Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi that you get there. I like that this feels appropriate for where he is at pre-Empire, pre-Yoda. Yes, pre-Yoda. This is a pre-Yoda, Luke. And again, everything you're saying, I'm echoing along with you. And I love the fact that he threw out the comments that Obi-Wan told me. Yep. You know, your eyes can deceive you. A true Jedi can feel the Force through, flowing through him. That was 100% uh, Obi-Wan in the ship. with uh, They put the blast shield down so he couldn't see the uh, stun droid, and he blocked. You know, he was able to block the one shocker. And I was like, oh, cool. I like that R2's a member of the team. Yes. You know, like, you know, Leia's not even saying, R2, plug in and shut down all the safety restraints and all that kind of stuff. I really liked that, you know, just there is a trust that these four together have developed in their working relationship based on things that they've escaped effectively before, recognizing they all bring talents to the table. Uh, they're not quite as seasoned as we see them later on, but there's this is definitely a forward progression from A New Hope. That part really worked for me versus feeling like we're rehashing that. The surprise that comes in the basement, I thought yeah. was really awesome because you learn a lot about 
not just Luke and Leia, because Luke's reaction is kind of what you'd expect from him. You need that, right? Because Luke is just that natural good guy. But Han Solo's reaction was one, especially with his relationship and Chewie and their history, and the fact that he freed Chewie and that's where the life debt came from and all that kind of thing, what they'd been through. I like that this very much feels like how these people should be reacting based on their own history. The writer got this, Jason Aaron got this all right. You and I are big fans from, really Scalped was, um, at least I think for both of us, right? Yeah. Our first Jason Aaron. Yes. And uh, this is just a writer who, it seems to be any property he interacts with, he just does the research and you feel the love and he gets it right. This is a guy who loves this Star Wars because I, I just feel the love coming off the pages and this feels authentic. It feels like he was, like you keep saying that, uh, and I agree with you on this, you can hear the characters' voices yes. through this. I feel like he was he was feeling them as he was writing it. <laughs> and that's, okay, that's, a, yeah. that's a hard thing to get right. Yeah, and I'll tell you, I, this open, again, the sequence of the different slaves of some of the different races that are going to come later on in the series is including, it looks like some of uh, Darth Maul's uh, people are there. Mm -hmm. So they really went to anything that could, well, in the future, let's just throw the aliens right there now. They're already in the universe, so let's just use them. And that was something that, I again, I love seeing. But the moment when Luke you know, takes down the guard, you know, cuts the arm off with the lightsaber, and then just at the speech, my name is Luke Skywalker, I'm here in the name of the Rebel Alliance. Anyone who hates the Empire, follow me. And that scene when he's standing there, he's got the lightsaber out, that right there, that for me was really cool. That was another really cool moment of this right here is the future Jedi Master that we know. You know, this is, the, this is again, the beginning of the confidence that Luke has and gets. Dude, the follow me page. Yeah. Wait, that is a page. Follow me and you see him sitting there. I mean, that whole visual, everything about that just worked. That's the kind of stuff that, I mean, that's Star Wars to me. When you have those yes. moments and you get to see that. Um, there was something that was great. The interactions between Leia and Han. <laughs> I really liked how they're, they're building up to Empire in this. And doing a really great job of recognizing where they're at in time-wise and building kind of like this little, you know, it's 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 definitely a softening from A New Hope between the two. There's the same kind of pushback that you got in A New Hope, but there's also something else clearly there. It's building and setting the stage for Empire in a way that I think is very subtle, but incredibly well done. They had He had sequences where he was definitely capturing both uh, Carrie Fisher's okay. and Harrison Ford's facial expressions. I think in the absolute right panels. It doesn't have to be, like I said before, not have to be every one of them. You have to get them in the right ones, so that way you're establishing the emotional tone. And I felt like, oh my gosh, it was so cool there that he clearly, you know, um, he has feelings for her. And um, she does him too. They're both denying it to themselves, but I really liked how real and authentic that felt. Yeah, the, uh, what is it you really want, Han Solo? That panel, the look on her face, I was like, oh, that's perfect. And then, then you go back to him, it's like, ah, uh, you know, you can see it again. I can hear their voices doing those, doing those two panels. This, it's, you know, right, you know, writing and artwork did a brilliant job with capturing their essence. I was just like, I love this. I absolutely love this stuff. Hans. Uh, Han knows the Millennium Falcon, believes in the Millennium Falcon. Yeah. Uh, and I really like when, like, the slaves come into the piece, you know, <laughs> like, Han's, like, initially, like, a few when he recognizes the numbers. But I do like that immediately he's like, sure, the more the merrier. That fits very much Han yes. Solo. And and also thinking, like, okay, we're going to get in the Falcon, and we'll escape in the Falcon. Everything will be fine getting out in the Falcon. Uh, not knowing what's happening to the Falcon yeah. <laughs> as this is going on. This piece where the negotiator's coming in, I'll admit my first read-through on this, I should have seen it coming. I did not immediately think Vader. I was, you know, I mean, so when that sequence, when he came out and it was Vader, I was like, of course. I mean, I mean it didn't took me a few seconds to just kind of go, you know, because you're wondering, you know, is the Overseer going to be in? I was wondering, 
is the Overseer going to be a new character? Is it going to be, you know, Vader would obviously be a choice. Is it going to be some other Admiral or something like that that was coming through? Um, when it's Vader, that was a stunning and powerful sequence. Yes. That is something I really want to attribute to the, um, we're, talk, we're going to talk today about the first three issues of this series. And I, I want to say the Vader moments in this were very much what I liked about um, some of the recent Vader appearances that they, when they've plugged Vader back into some of the movies or the TV shows right now, we've gotten some really, really cool Vader. And this is tapping into that territory. Uh, Vader's always been a cool character. We're just getting more screen time with him and very, very powerful moments. See, that's one thing, The again, with you, when they, like the, the new negotiators here, I wasn't thinking Vader. You flip the page, and it's a full-page spread of him walking out. Yep. I heard the theme. I heard, you know, heard the breathing. I was like, oh, this is perfect. This is absolutely perfect. And everything you said about how current stuff use of Vader is absolutely brilliant because, you know, Vader is really powerful. Yep. And – the movie showed some power, but they didn't really go to the level of how dangerous Vader was. And part of it, I think, is because when the movies first came out, they weren't thinking that scope. It wasn't until later Agreed. on that they really started understanding just how powerful the Jedi is going to be, how powerful Vader is going to be. So now in these stories that are taking place chronologically, you know, the story arc wise, it takes place before this stuff. But it's actually, you know, being created after everybody understands how powerful Vader is. They're letting, you know, Vader have that power levels. You know, again, it's kind of like, you know, with uh, Star Trek, where you have, you know, the the, the original series, the, the look of the Enterprise went one way. You know, because, again, it was based on, you know, what the current TV was doing. And then when you start going back to future episodes, future TV series that occur before the original series, yeah. their ships look more high tech, but you know, they're trying not to make it look as clean and fancy as like next generation. So you can kind of say, see, it's, it's, it's still in development, but it still looked more fancier than the next, than the original series, just because where the re- when the original series was made, same thing they're kind of doing with Vader. They're making sure everybody, you know, we see how powerful he is and it fits to what we know about Vader now so all these all the vader sequences were absolutely brilliant i love this i really liked when han announced that it was vader it starts to set a stage for what happens over the next couple issues and then this issue with some immediacy luke and leia having very different emotional reactions to vader um and some of it in parallel and in parody but you know for leia in particular let's focus on her for right now where, you know, Han's, like, trying to get everyone out of there, right? And and he's recognizing the fact that we have a doorway here. Let's get out of here. And he's right. Actually, I'm, yes. very, t- I'm very team Han on this one. We've got these slaves here. We've got an opportunity to get out um, and, and actually get away scot-free without, with a minimal amount of uh, gunplay. Uh, I think Han Solo was in the right of this piece, yet what you are sympathetic to Princess Leia and understanding like Alderaan was blown up. This is a man who she has, there's a lot of reasons to lash out at. And she's like, no, 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 take the shot. This is the chance to take him out, you know, as, as the leader. And it's one of the things that is often forgotten. I, I forget what I watched recently that was referencing the fact that Princess Leia really is the leader here. Um, and um, it's it's easy to forget that because of the fact that you've got the cool swagger of Han Solo who's in charge of his ship and Luke Skywalker being this, you know, Jedi in training. Leia is the leader of the rebellion, you know, is, with what she's doing and the role that she's taking, the representative of the rebellion here. So, you know, she's basically telling him, you know, hey, hang on, forget about us. Killing him is more important because she's like this lead representative being the princess and then being, you know, of the such a upstanding, you know, a higher standing member of the rebellion in there. I like that Chewie's, Chewie did it. Yeah. Chewie listened to her. That was really, really, intru- I, like, I loved everything about the way that that played out. It felt, it was a very emotional, very impulsive piece. 
but you understood the whys behind it. Everything made sense. I uh, completely agree with everything you're saying. And again, I, I, you know, I'm with you. I'm 100 team hand, but I completely understand why uh, Leah made the order. Yeah, you know, because again, you know, it's it completely fits these characters, and with Chewie following the orders, 100 percent agree with that. You know, and I love that. You know, Chewie fires the first shot, and of course, Vader blocks it, and then Chewie just opens up. You start looking at the number of blasts coming down there. And, you know, and, and Vader's using his guns <laughs> as shields. Yes. And I love that. I love the fact that, you know, everybody's dead. Chewie did a great job taking out all of the, uh, all of the stormtroopers because Vader just kept throwing them at them. And then you using the force sequence. Wait, dude's using the force to throw stormtroopers in front of blaster files. So he <laughs> survives. I, I absolutely adore, like everything about that. I'm like, this is, this is Darth Vader. And yes. I'm like, this is what makes him a, such a such a villain. And I, I just loved like everything about that. It so worked. Yes, and again, it's it so fits how again this this is the guy who slaughtered little children. <laughs> you know. Yes. Yes. So yes, I completely understand this. I you know, and again, I love the moment where Chewie's got him in the sights, and Vader's not worried at all. Because he's bringing down the entire building on top of Chewie. You know, again, showing the levels of the power levels of Vader was brilliant here. I like the force sequence where not only is he sending them after Chewie, but he's feeling through the force the presence of the rebel because they were feeling each other during that yeah. run. He knew the pilot was there. He knew Luke was there. And I really liked that sequence because it added another sense of this this building intrigue with Luke and Vader that I think this series captured so well. And it's something where we've we've so many stories have been written now with these characters, and and honestly, there's been interpretations of events, you know, by other writers at this point who've done this. I think this just captured so well this feeling. Uh, the pacing is something I've said more than once off of this. Just really worked. This is a page turner and a half. And it's one of those things where I say that, but I found myself going back to pages and looking at them. Like my first read through was, it was. It was far from like this frantic turning of page to page to page to find out what was going on. I did that, but then I'd like, wait a minute. Okay. And I'd flip back and forth between pages and and just marvel at what I was seeing in front of me. It was such an interesting journey. My journey was kind of unique from this reading this book the first time through and, and multiple read-throughs since. Uh, I just really like basked in the experience yes and it's one of the reasons why i really wanted to do this because i felt like this was something that if you know you've listened to us typically as we you know cover superhero stuff and i I love all of that uh this is a kind of a cool opportunity to talk about something else that we love i was hoping you dig this and here's the funny part we didn't like talk about this one a lot beforehand other than the fact what it was hey jim i was kind of thinking you know Unfortunately, John Cassidy had passed. I really am a fan of his artwork. What do you think about maybe just for a chance to do something a little different? We haven't had a chance to do little Star Wars, and we jumped to that 2015 series. That was the extent of our conversation about this. So I didn't know if you – had you read this before, or was this no, your first read-through? No, this is, this is my first read-through, and it's funny. I, 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 I stopped at issue three. Because I knew we were going to talk uh, one, two, and three today, uh-huh. and I stopped. So I'm dying to continue reading because I, uh, again, it's one of those things where I, you know where I wanted to not have any preconceived knowledge of what's going to happen. You know, so it's I'm, I'm thrilled for when we're done talking, so I can start reading it again. Because, dude, I absolutely love this. It's one of the things that I'm really enjoying about um, this. Uh, <laughs> it's weird to say season two that we're doing, but opening up 
kind of the floodgates to be able to do some unique stuff like this. It's I think it's a chance for us to like connect with um, some of the other things that we enjoy and be able to share them with our audience. And I'm hoping for people out there that maybe haven't had a chance to touch this yet that maybe this is pointing you to something, especially if you're one of those Star Wars fans, because I hear this a lot with some of my friends who are Star Wars fans, but don't care about some of some don't care for some of the more recent stuff. They didn't like the most recent films or they felt like they liked the first one, but then when the second and third one came out, they lost interest or maybe don't like the TV series as much uh, that, uh, you know, I, I would honestly love for them to read this yes, because I feel like this is that star Wars for people. Like I've enjoyed all of that stuff. So everything I was mentioning before that, you know, there's some criticisms out for. That's okay. I, it's more uh, set, establishing a baseline for people listening to this. There's a lot of stuff that's out there that I think has been good Star Wars versus great Star Wars that I really enjoyed. I'm glad I saw it. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there that I think has been okay Star Wars where I'm, I don't know, Saturday afternoon, it's not too shabby to watch some okay Star Wars because yeah. I like hanging out in the Star Wars universe. So I'm that kind of fan with it. But I think there's certain things that fall into that category of I would give this to a casual Star Wars fan who is like, I enjoy some really terrific Star Wars. I would give them this in an instant because I feel it falls into that category. Oh, big time. I 100% agree with you. Because, again, we've been gushing over this just because it reminds us so much of New Hope. You know, this, again, it takes place right after New Hope. This 100% feels like it takes place right after New Hope. I love it. It's something that it really just captures it. And again, with all the the mainstay, the, the commonality stuff that always happens in the Star Wars universe and all the different, all the great movies, you have those moments where things look bad. Uh, then they get worse. <laughs> you know? And I love just how that always happens in the movies and it's happening here in the comic because Chewie goes down. They're like, alert. You know, he's like, you know, Leia's like, ah, we're in trouble. No, 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 no. We still got the Falcon. No, we don't have the Falcon. <laughs> um, you know, okay, okay, let's, we'll figure this out. And then the, the alert hits. So every time you just, when you think, hey, it's going to get better, no, it gets worse. And I love how they played that off how they captured that in the comic. And this, again, was something that I seriously was like, this is Star Wars to me, man. There's also a real sense of danger. And that's something that I really enjoy. You know, because there's characters where you're like, you know that Han, Luke, and Leia survived, but yet you feel the danger. Like, what is going to happen to them here? You feel that danger. Um, 3PO and the whole, like when the gun was there, I knew where that was going. You know, the idea of 3PO grabbing that. The other piece, too, is Han Solo piloting an Imperial Walker. Sign me up every day. I also like that, yes, he's saying that he can drive anything, but I like that that isn't as clean. Star Wars, one of the things I think that works the best about Star Wars is there's a little bit of dirt under the nails with Star Wars. That's what's different than Star Wars than Star Trek, if I'm making any sense with that analogy. And... I like the distinction because I love Star Trek, but Star Trek doesn't have the dirt under the nails. Star Wars does. And I think it's the reason why the two, like to me, the two go together versus it being a choice. I don't want to choose. I I don't want Star, Star Wars to ever feel like Star Trek to me to the point where I'm like, do you like Star, Star Wars better or Star Trek better? I it was. It's kind of like the comparison. Did you watch Babylon 5? Yes. So there used to be a lot of comparisons between Babylon 5 and Deep Space Nine. And I feel like if you watched both, the and you really watch both, the there's a lot of separation that happens very, very quickly. Because I think both are quality shows. And I think when you start to really get into the meat and potatoes of both series... Even though they both take place on a space station, there's something like distinctly different about both that like make them very, very valid in the kind of storytelling that's being told there. I feel that's true. This, this to me is Star Wars in front of me. This could not be a Star Trek story. If you tried telling this story in the Star Trek universe, it would play very differently because it's Star Trek in all the right ways. 
And that's where this piece works. Luke and the ultimate, like, where this this ends. Yeah. And the fact that he still has that connection with Ben, where Luke's like, I, I, this is very personal for Luke. Luke wants to go after Vader because Vader's the one who killed Ben and killed his father in his, yeah. you know, because as far as he knows, killed yeah. his father. And I like when we see these two facing off as a conclusion and Ben's like, run. I, ben knows he's not ready. Ben knows what this situation is. And I really loved, like, if you're going to end an issue, this is how you end an issue. Oh, my God, dude. And again, you know, we all heard Alec Guinness's voice there. Oh, yeah. You know, in the run, run, you know, 100% heard that. So it's, you know, this was, again, one of those moments where you're just like, yeah. And you know why he's telling him to run? Because we know how good Vader is. Yeah, yeah. And we know how bad Luke is. <laughs> If you haven't had a chance to take a look at the director's cut, so I'm looking at this in the Marvel app right now. I ended up uh, rereading it with the director's cut. What it does have in the back, it has a script by Jason Aaron. So if you're a fan of seeing the script and, and how the script plays out, there is a really cool Jason Aaron script in there. And then there's some art pages from John Cassidy that are the sketch pages where you get to see it without the coloring. And um, uh, I'm sorry, John Cassidy's beautiful artwork um, in those pages without the color. And I, I love don't get, Laura Martin as a colorist totally complements the amazing artwork here. But um, it's nice to be able to see what it looked like before the colors were put on there. And then to go back and then appreciate what it looked like with the colors there. Um, this this all just really, really worked for me. It's worth taking a look at that director's cut if you haven't had a chance to, um, that I wanted to shout out. The issue two cover is way cool. Because <laughs> we open up with this awesome cover with the walkers in the background and Vader being on top and all these stormtroopers and Han and Chewie outmanned, outgunned in a way that we remember from what was going on in A New Hope. This is the bravery and also cunning of Han Solo. Yeah. And I think when that's captured really well, it's it's something where Han Solo is a guy who narrow who who is a master at narrowly escaping. Yes. Um and even when it doesn't go well, finding then a way to escape when it doesn't go well. Uh, there's there's something to that about Han Solo that just makes him captivating to me when he's written right. And uh, this cover, I think, is just a brilliant opening. Dude, it cracks me up seeing him do the shh to, to Chewie. <laughs> like, really, guy? You think you're going to be able to hide from them? I, it, again, I laughed out loud with this cover. Again, brilliant, uh, brilliant, true Han, uh, you know, Han and Chewie moment. John Cassidy, I, I had to have had fun with this, you yeah. know, as far as being able to enjoy laying out this cover and what it looks like. And I, again, I like the crawl. Um, the crawl is really important to me because, you know, it brings you back into this particular episode. But I want to get right to the battle. This is a Luke, again, not trained. You know, he was trained by Ben, but not Yoda trained yet. I love seeing this initial battle and how... Luke was really outgunned on this one. <laughs> um, Vader showing the force power. It, it was really an opportunity where he's thinking he's going to cut down the pilot that took down the Death Star. The only thing that saved Luke's life was the, I think, was the recognition of the saber. Yes. That gave him that moment of hesitation. Vader was ready to cut him down. This was just some punk, you know, before that. I love how you killed my father. I've killed many, very many fathers. You'll have to be more specific. You know, Vader just was not even caring anything about this. Blocks the first shot. He's like, you're not worthy of this. You know, he's like, this is the most pathetic. You're not even worth the seconds it would take to finish you off. I was like, oh, that is just this great Vader moment to the point where he pulls the lightsaber out of his hands using the force power. Going, what? You were given this. You have no training. You're nothing. Just about to cut him down. And recognizing his lightsaber. Once he saw that, that changed everything. That was the pause. That was the what's going on here. You know, and then and of course hand to the rescue with the uh, Imperial Walker. <laughs> 
that whole that whole sequence was really really fantastic because I like that the Walker escape is really them like driving a speeding car that is when they don't have a license. Yeah, <laughs> and and I I I love it. It's so there's a I, I mentioned before there's a humor value to Star Wars and it's got to be the right amount of adventure action and subtle with danger because this gets dark. You know, there's points in time where Luke's rushing to escape too, and Vader's using his saber as basically a baton that he's throwing at these slaves and cutting them down. It, the the death count and the body count around Luke um, just becomes this overwhelming piece, and I really liked seeing how this had an, a growing effect on Luke throughout this. When you're talking about character development and really like, what is the purpose of these doing these stories? Are we just filling in some of these these subtle little sequences to try and you know fill some comic book pages to kind of capture some Star Wars fans? Or are we really trying to do something special here? This is special because they're building characters towards where they were, understanding there was some clear time passage between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, and filling that in with some character development that actually, it's weird to say that a comic can enhance a movie that you grew up loving. I love Empire Strikes Back. Oh, big time. And I feel like this has done everything to start enhancing, like every page turn is enhancing more what I liked about Empire Strikes Back. Yes, oh God, yeah. And again, it's, the thing I love is, again, seeing Vader just going off here. You know, cutting people down. He's choking two people at the same time while he's cutting down another one. Throws the lightsaber, as you said, keeps it active while it's going, you know, and cuts the guy down. Just as Luke's about to reach for it, oh, pulls it back. <laughs> really, really great stuff. The fighting okay. between Han and Leia inside the walker I yeah. thought was really great. The walker bits were great because you had a sense of scale and size that this is this big hulking machine it's um it'd be like the equivalent of me driving a garbage truck you know yes. it's um i've i've driven u-hauls and things like that before where they're just larger vehicles than i'm normally used to driving i've never been behind the wheel of a bus i don't think you want that um but that would be the equivalent of me being behind the bus for the first time you have to get used to these things any new vehicle that's larger you know, I went from a smaller vehicle to now I drive a Wrangler. You know, I mean, it's that there was a little bit of a learning curve, you know, as far as just navigating with the road and actually feeling like you're in control of the vehicle. Uh, I love that this felt like that. That gave me that feeling where I could put myself in the shoes of Han Solo in those sequences, or at least the passenger. <laughs> and I love that. I love when a, when a story creates a tone and a mood where you're just along for the ride. And that was something that was really well done on this. Oh, God, yeah. And again, I loved how it's the Jawas who are repairing the, uh, getting the cannons ready to go. Yes. Because again, you know, tie back to the Jawas because they're scavengers, but they're also, you know, they know the technical side. They can figure this out. Them and R2 working together, they'll get the cannons running eventually. <laughs> 3PO dropping the gun was absolutely hysterical. <laughs> He's like, oh dear, I surrender. I, I love the attention to detail of the condition of 3PO's one leg and you know the fact that it was a different color than the rest of him. You know, the sense of th this is this robot that's been through some battle damage. So that, that part was really, really cool. Yes. Oh yeah. And again, you know, at the showing the it was kind of a you have the funny moment. We well, have the great dialogue between Luke, uh, between Han and uh, Leia. Then you've got your comedy moments of three PO being three PO, you know. But then right after that, you go right back into the action sequence. Great moments with you know Luke just scrambling. The people, the slaves that he tried to free, most of them just got killed, you know. But you know Luke's trying, and he's still scrambling, and to the point where he's like. He's like, I'll figure out something here. And as he's trying to figure out, the light, his lightsaber keeps coming back and killing more people. And I love that moment when Luke finally sees something. I can do this. I got this. And we have the speeders, you know, the, the runners. Again, that 
in the Star Wars universe, these aren't introduced until the Return of the Jedi, but right here, it's showing Luke's first uh, dealings with him. So I kind of like the fact that we have a moment where Luke actually has his first interactions with these, so that way, in the Return of the Jedi, it makes more sense how comfortable he is on those things. One of the areas where I really enjoy this story is this... Like, Luke gets downtrodden, and Luke starts to question himself. And that's where he's relatable, right? Because we've all been there before, right? Where it's like, I just don't know if I can do it. I think the piece where heroes really rise up and they actually motivate you is when they get there. They get to their lowest point, then they see that one spark. And he looks at that and goes, yeah, I'm a farm boy, all right? A farm boy who can bullseye womp rats. Which, again, takes us back to some classic lines from classic Star Wars and it just makes you grin from ear to ear. And I, I loved every bit about seeing the speeder bikes in this. Yeah. You know, I think this was a great opportunity to just get to know a little bit more about Luke, see Luke be effective in a different way. This is the X-Wing pilot who's doing some really, really cool stuff because he used that as his example. And I like that, you know, it's he's not trying to battle Vader with Vader's powers because he's not ready Jedi wise to go toe to toe to him that way. Let's go to where my home, my ground is. Let's let's yeah. take this to my comfort level, my comfort zone, and utilize that as a way to to kind of keep moving forward. With this I really liked everything about that because it was cool. Oh God, yeah, and I'll tell you, you know, the action sequence, the motion, just the Luke on the bike going around, and I love that moment when he's cutting down stormtroopers. And Vader is just standing there calm as can be, knowing he's safe, knowing yep. that the Force is protecting him. Maybe Vader's even moving bodies in the way of blasts. Not 100% certain on that, but I do love the fact that after that run, he's like, that boy, perhaps I was too hasty to dismiss him. What have you been up to, Obi-Wan? And I was like, oh, he's going to start figuring this out. And again, this was the, the moment at, and this scene. I was like, then I remember the beginning of Empire Strikes Back. Vader was so hell-bent on finding Luke. He was hunting down Luke. And I'm like, oh, this is the beginning of the obsession with Luke when he figures out who Luke is. And I'm like, oh, that is awesome. This is wonderful. I was like just absolutely loving just that little realization on just that one, on the, just on this one little panel here. But then they don't let the action calm down. His hand's trying to step on him with the Imperial Walker. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. That was really, really awesome. Because it gives you a sense of scale. Like, he's trying to step on him with this giant thing. And this is a time where we hadn't seen a whole lot of what you could do with the Force. And uh, Empire is where we, you know, first saw Yoda, you know, pulling out an X-Wing from, you know, the water. Uh, this is a this is a whole different level of I'm going to battle. And I yes. really, really enjoyed that piece. Yes. Oh, God, yeah. And... See Invader hold up the leg, and they're just sitting there, and they finally get the guns ready, and they start blasting at, uh, at Vader with the main guns burying him. And I thought that, again, this is outstanding, because we all have, obviously, we know Vader lives, you know, but the question is, how much damage did this do? How much, you know, and I was like, I was, it, it was something that you're sitting there excited to see what's happening next. <laughs> Big moments of survival. And it's one of the things, I mentioned survival earlier. Survival's really important in this. These are characters that survive sequences. And that's something that really stood out for me about this, was the fact that um, this isn't about winning. You know, and uh, with the Rebels, even the Death Star, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a, they didn't, when they won against, they won against the Empire in the sense that they destroyed the Death Star, but the Empire's still out there. Like, this set them back. It did not derail them. And this is another example of this is them trying to escape this situation and get these slaves out of there the best that they can. Even that's not a victory because look at how many deaths happened along the way in this. That's what I mean about dirt under the fingernails that you get with Star Wars. And... It's something that, you know, seeing them continue to pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and keep going. I thought that part was just really, really well done here. Yes. Oh, God, yeah. And, again, just the, the, ending, again, the ending of this issue 
is absolutely brilliant in that you have these moments of it looks like they're winning. looks like they're going to get away. Han and Lee are marching out. They're moving on. They got the main guns firing. Things are looking good. Luke is picking up his lightsaber. Still no word on Chewie and 3PO. But you're like, eh, they'll be fine. Everything is good. And then you flip the page and you see Vader's not down. And you see Vader get up, and you have your unfortunate uh, storm shoot, uh, stormtrooper who sees him without his mask on, and, well, yeah, he ain't around anymore. But that final ending page where it's Vader walking out you know, out there telling, you know, the overseer is asking for permission to evacuate because they're going to rig up the, the blow of the reactor, and Vader's like, oh, no, you don't leave. You know, if you leave, I will kill you. You know, you die with this planet. Fix it. You know, and then he's like calls everybody else. The invaders must die, except the boy. Leave him to me. I'd love just that again. I can hear Vader's voice in this as he's saying these lines, and then you just start seeing the troopers. Wait, you know, wait, hold on. We got to talk about that sequence with the stormtrooper. Yeah, okay. Walking in on him. I, the, I'm not discounting anything you're going over right now because I'm like nodding along and grinning, but. Vader, you know, because of what happened, you know, Vader survived as we knew he was going to and all that. But that is something where because of the nature of it, his helmet got, you know, torn off and um, he was sitting there with his face, his deformed face exposed and that type of thing. The stormtrooper saw it and it was like you know, his reaction alone. Vader's like, I don't want anybody seeing this. He t- really twisted the stormtrooper's head and he's, you know, moving back to business which is leading to the sequence that you're saying, but oh my gosh, was that a cool sequence as far yes. as, like, how do you work for that man? Like, you just don't know, like, what are you what are you going to walk into and stumble into that is going to be the death of you? Yeah, it's, again, it's working for the Empire is not the, not a good long-term career goal. <laughs> no, no, it is not. But what a great ending to this issue. An absolutely amazing ending to this issue. The This issue, this third part, was, and I say it's kind of an appropriate one for us to use to kind of wrap up the first of this two-part look at the, the Star Wars series. Uh, again, a great, great John Cassidy cover. Yeah. Um, and I, I would say the first cover was my favorite just because of the, just kind of the layout and everything. This is a close close second just because of the design luke doing it you know the whole swing of the lightsaber sw- driving through with the speeder bike and stormtroopers just being swiped out of the way everywhere it is a very cool action sequence oh definitely yeah again i love this i these these covers have been absolutely joys just to just to look at you know and it's uh, the uh, the interior artwork, the cover artwork, all this stuff has just been so much fun. Just reading and and just you know enjoying. This has been just absolutely you know first read through. I had this big old grin on my face. I still have that same grin every time I'm going into this. You know, yeah. and it's something that again, it's we talk about how it captivates, goes back to the childhood, goes back to the beginnings of our Star Wars love, but it's also just. A genuine, a genuine love for this medium that we have. I agree. You know, comic books, you know, it's hard to show motion on a page. It's hard to show the action. It's hard to give get an emotional re- response from people based on just images, just on the paper, flat images. You know, in movies and TV shows, sometimes it's a little bit easier because it's an actual living person and you can really dive into it, but... With this one, man, I'll tell you, there's there's a couple of the scenes where some of these slaves are getting cut down, and you're just like, whoa, you know, and it, it's, you know, some of the Vader kills were just like, whoa, and then, like, in this issue, when we got the person getting, you know, you, you see them getting just cut pretty much in half by the blasters, you know, from the stormtroopers, and just everything, you're just like, damn, this is some serious body count going. Again, mentioning the fact that they're surviving this, the sense of danger to, like, Luke is dealing with overwhelming numbers, but yes, doing quite well surviving. Han and Leia in the walker 
with the guns being back up, they're not in the best of condition right now because they're facing off against increasing odds against them because the Empire's had a chance to regroup and start preparing for them. So that piece is going on. Chewie, in the meantime, has discovered 3PO and made his way back to the Falcon, which is the piece that, like, this was a really good use of Chewie. As I don't want to say that I completely forgot about him, but because so much action was going on with some of the other characters, he did kind of have this stealth moment where he was able to kind of sneak around and wind up, you know, being being a forefront figure again in all of the right ways. I really liked how that played out because he came back in at the right time where we needed like that hoorah moment of like, oh, finally, this is a way where maybe he can get the Falcon going and get them over there. I like that that wasn't instantaneous either, though. This is a Falcon that's been picked over. (laughs) So there's there's some work that needs to be done over there. And that part really like worked for me a great deal. Oh, God, yeah. And again, great chewy moments, you know, and I love how Han and Leia are in the cockpit working together. And but again, the one thing that last issue, you know, Vader told the troops, focus on the thing. I will take out the walker. So when he first starts with the, you know, using the force to stop the crushing foot that you're thinking, oh, okay, that's his plan. Oh, no. Later on, we're going to see Vader's actual plan. And I love how that pops up. But you know, the Empire is still, they're throwing all this stuff at, at that walker. And one sequence when they're showing on, when they're marching through the city, you see TIE fighters coming in. You see stormtroopers on the ground above, you know, on the, uh, on the building tops. You know, everybody is just firing on that, at that walker. And we know these walkers are tough to take down. We have saw that in Empire Strikes Back, how tough they are. You know, so I love the fact that the Empire knows how dangerous they are, and they're throwing a small little army of scout walkers, assault tanks, combat speeders, anything they can think of, you know, to throw at this thing. You know, and again, I love the fact that remind me never to attack a uh, another weapons factory. <laughs> Yeah, no you know, kidding. Yeah, you're, you attack the weapons factory. Of course, they're going to have some armaments. I love that sequence. Yes, yeah, that was something that really stood out for me. One of the, the you, you mentioned the fact that Vader like does this bit where he's he's got a plan for the Walker and he's he's taking it down piece by piece. That was a great sequence because it leads to this moment where Han and Leia are thinking this might be it. Yeah, you know, and they have this moment together, and you see how that is going to build when you go through something like that with somebody else. It starts to build a a camaraderie, a a different sort of relationship. In the case of these two, you see how it's edging them closer and closer to a different sort of respect for each other, that the two of them coming from very different worlds and very different processes are still figuring out. But I loved that sequence because it further moved that needle. And you can see how that was a big needle mover in many yes. ways. Oh, yeah. Again, Great little subtle usage of the hand, Leia. You know, just that little bit there. Again, always going back towards bringing those two who are destined to be together right as the walker's coming down. And, again, Luke in for the save. You know, the troops are moving in for the kill. Luke comes flying in, and he starts cutting down people. And, again, we go back to that cover, that great cover of Luke cutting down the troopers, you know, the stormtroopers. You know, we're kind of seeing that here. You know, to the point where, you know, it gives them a chance to run into the trash fields where the Falcon's hidden. You know, but Luke being Luke, this right here was a great Luke moment. When they realize that the reactor's not going to go off, and he's like, if we don't take this off, if we don't take this reactor out, all these people who died were for nothing. And I can't have that. I love just that moment of Luke going, I'm going to sacrifice myself if I have to. I've got to do this. And Luke flying into it, but also Vader recognizing that kid's going to do another, uh, destroy another thing of mine. I'm not letting that happen. And I love that Vader, again, throws one of his guys, you know, force throws somebody and takes over the, the pursuit of Luke. Yeah, and that part was that part was really something that stuck for me. I also want to point out when Luke is doing the action, we see him know and kind of raging in, which is what you know Luke is Luke is running and gunning, you know, in in that moment. Leia, 
she's grabbing Han. Han took the brunt of, you know, when they went down, you know, just unfortunate sometimes where you're seated and things like that. I like that she's helping him out, but she's also directing everybody else. We're seeing her leadership. Run, run for the trash field. She's guiding people on how to escape and how to get out. She's thinking bigger picture of everybody she can save. I loved that. It was a great <laughs> Leia moment and showing, I think, the strength of her leadership. And you don't need like eight panels of that. That part worked really well. No, no. Again, yeah. You know, you've got a limit on number of panels of what you can do, but they're doing. They're picking their shot, and they're doing a good job with uh, spreading this out. I was again, this felt had the flow, had the feel for me of an actual physical action going on. Yep. You know the fight again. That's I'm reminded back to you know New Hope when Luke's flying through the canyon to take out the Death Star. You know, and Vader's on his trail, and all that. You know, you're still seeing that kind of. I'm still getting that same kind of groove of these two. You know, again. Two great pilots, you know, going at it. I loved, I, again, this was one of those things where I was like, this is outstanding. The Luke can't let that go. Vader's, Vader's getting ready to leave, and Luke's like, this, this can't be, they, I can't let it all be for nothing. This, yeah. there has to be, the, and he's talking about the deaths and everything that's happened here and, and everything they did with their action. If if the, he doesn't do something, if something doesn't happen here, it will all in his mind it will all have been for nothing, and he can't let it sit that way. He needs this to have been for something. He just totally, almost sacrifices himself for the purpose of making this happen. It's a very driven Luke, and you. It's not the first time we've seen. You know that's something in New in New Hope. He went into that trench. You know, the assumption is, look what happened to everybody else. How am I going to make it through this? Mm -hmm. um, he was going in there on a suicide run, potentially, hoping against hope that maybe there's some small, slim possibility he might be able to get there and might be able to do something. But it didn't look good. And I really like that about this where... It's not a random thing. He doesn't have a death wish or anything like that. It's about principles. It's about moral. It's about fighting the fight and, and trying to make a better world and a better, you know, and the only way to do that is to take down this empire, this evil empire. I really love seeing that drive and the fact that you get why he would go this far. And there's reasons behind it. Some of them are very, very personal. And some of them are... Um, you know, they're, some of them are coming from, they're all coming from the inside, but from very different places from the inside. Because I do believe he's very much doing this for others, while at the same time having very personal reasons for it. And I think all of them are valid, um, some more noble than others. And I love that about his humanity. That's something that really comes out in this piece. Yeah, and again, I always do chuckle, what, chuckle, but enjoy the fact that he's like, I'm sorry, Father. Sorry, I'll never be the Jedi you were. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, guess what, kid? <laughs> I, I do. I, that is something that yeah, I do love the fact that Luke still he doesn't know he doesn't know the truth yet. You know, so it's a uh, it's kind of a neat little bit here. The escape from the uh, Empire using the Millennium Falcon and the hyperdrive, and Leia's constant questioning of will this bucket of bolts actually work and do what it's supposed to, I think is something that when it does, it's breathtaking. Yeah. And I, I they captured that hyperspace jump in a way that I it's one of those crowning moments. Um if if you get a chance if you're a Star Wars fan, and Jim, I don't think you've you haven't been to Disney and no. but if you get a chance to go to either the um East Coast or the West Coast or um uh, I don't know if there's one overseas. Um, but I, I do know on both the East Coast and West Coast Disney parks, they have the um, Galaxy's Edge and the ability to ride in the Millennium Falcon. It's cool. Yeah. It is awesome. absolutely cool to be in that cockpit and to do it. And um, highly recommend it uh, as something that uh, if you're a Star Wars fan, you just go and do. Because the breathtaking part is walking through Batu, which has has kind of this feeling of Mos Eisley, you know, sort of. Um, but seeing the Millennium Falcon in front of you, because the ride queue is the Millennium Falcon. 
Oh, nice. So, like, you are actually walking outside the Millennium Falcon to walk into the Millennium Falcon. Oh, um, nice. So you nice. see, you actually see a giant, breathtaking, life-size Millennium Falcon in front of you that has landed in this place, knowing that you're going to go inside, knowing that you're going to eventually get to go into the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon. Uh, but when you go when you go into the Millennium Falcon, you actually get to go into the chat where the chess table is and the whole all of that's there. They have different doors that you can go through that will lead you to like they have multiple cockpits. But you don't like you you are never taken out of the idea that you're going into the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon. Super cool. Oh, that um, is awesome. Yeah, so this that is awesome. This just took me to that kind of moment of wow, this just feels so authentic and so real. These Vader moments where you get a chance to see Vader reflecting in all of this, you know, where you know he's being getting the feedback and those pieces, his reflecting on the boy. The boy is your last great hope, isn't he, Obi Wan? He's what you died to protect. And I like that, you know, Vader's kind of like starting to get this idea of you know, the dark side always win. He'll be my weapon, not yours. Um, he doesn't realize it's his kid yet, but he recognizes that this was Obi-Wan's hope. There's something here about this. Um, I am just anxious to see how close this series gets, because I have not read all of this series leading up to, because um, th- this series ends, and then I think, I'm assuming the next one takes place after Empire, I'm assuming, but I haven't read that one yet either. Um, I, I'm farther along, obviously, on this series than you are because this was my suggestion, but it's gripping. I really am enjoying this series so far. This whole sequence right now with Leia and Luke having their special moments and um, the slaves even, you know, like yeah. being being genuinely like hugging each other, different races, kind of genuinely being glad that they've survived and typical C-3PO having to be put back together by R2-D2. <laughs> it was just, Again. <laughs> I just, I just think just a really cool ending to these three issues. That was, you know, a great way. And they gave us an epilogue. Yes. And, and again, you know, I love just this little tie into back on Tatooine, just on, you know, the, the things they're dumping the body, but Oh, that's just that crazy wizard Kenobi, I think he's called. Don't worry about him, you know. And you go inside Ben's house, and there's a little package for Luke. I'm like, oh, what's in there? Come on, what's in the box? <laughs> so, so very cool. Um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do for next episode. We're gonna take a look at issues four, five, and six. But really, just a, a fun journey. I'm glad we're having the opportunity to do this one uh, because this is our first foray into taking a look at Star Wars. And uh, I'm honestly, I'm hoping it's a first of multiple forays into uh, Star Wars down the road. You know, different kind of Star Wars series and things because uh, we have this as something we can touch base on. But if you're out there you're, and you've been saying to yourself, I'm a Star Wars fan who's just not finding that thing that makes me reconnect with what I loved about Star Wars, give this a shot because uh, this is really, really a good read. I would like to remind everyone about our show voicemail line. It's 1-440-388-4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. We love having you part of the show. Feel free to send us voicemail messages that way. Ragingbullets at gmail.com is our email address. You prefer to contact us that way. Ragingbullets.com is, of course, our show website. And we do feed into X slash Twitter, depending on whatever you like to call it, and our Facebook fan page. We are proud to be part of a great Facebook group community. I want to thank everyone who continues to post there. I love seeing all of the content that ends up going up over there. I am every other week on Is It Jaws with Paul Spataro, and we do movie reviews, so please consider joining us over there. The About Us section of our show website is where you can connect with us on all kinds of social media platforms and gaming platforms. We like connecting with you how you would like to connect with us. We are sponsored, as always, by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Mr. Seglin, what's going on over at DCBService.com? AEW Gallery Sting Statue, 25% off, only $44.99. Thank you, DCBS. You aren't going to do the Tony Schiavone again? <laughs> Come on, you got to do it again. One more time. It's stinging! 
over at InStockTrades.com. We've got their deals of the week. we got Batman Year 1 and 2, part of that DC Finest line. $39.99 regularly, 55% off, only $17.99. Superman, the first superhero, $39.99 regularly, 55% off, only $17.99. Both covers of ROM, the original Marvel Years Omnibus hardcover, are discounted. They're $125 regularly, 46% off, only $67.50. The Batman First Night hardcover, 50% off, $29.99 regularly, $14.99 is the price for you. Vinland Saga Deluxe Hardcover Volume 5, $54.99 regularly, 45% off, only $30.24. And finally, the Wild Cats Compendium Volume 1 Trade Paperback, $59.99 regularly, 50% off, only $29.99. Thank you, DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for supporting us and a lot of other great podcasts. We really appreciate you. Our next episode, Jim and I are going to be back and we're going to wrap up our discussion with Star Wars 4, 5, and 6 from 2015. We will see you then. May the Force be with you. Bye! On November 13th, Sean Whalen was asked to stop constantly talking about comic books. That request came from his wife. Deep down, he knew she was right, but he also knew that someday he would find someone that would talk to him. With nowhere else to go, he appeared at the home of his childhood friend, Jim Segulin. Sometime earlier, Segulin's boss had requested that he shut up about his comic books and never speak of them again. Can two grown men put out a comics podcast without driving each other crazy? It's Raging Bullets, the comics fan podcast. Sean Whalen as Dr. Norge, and Jim Segulin as the sensei of the whatnot and the Duke of You Know. It's a spoiler podcast, so they will go in depth into the plot line, story twists, and whatnot of the comics they are reviewing. So if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you may better enjoy the show.